You're listening to the Fashion Ambition Podcast, and I'm your host, Natalie Robin. The Fashion Ambition Podcast is all about bringing you the tools and strategies to start and scale your business or career in fashion through conversations with industry experts who have been there and done that. Whether you're a startup founder, a new fashion graduate, or a soon-to-be graduate like me, or you just know that a career in fashion is your calling, we have an episode to help you launch. Make sure to keep up with new episodes by following the podcast at The Fashion Ambition on Instagram, where I update you on new episodes every week. You can also find my blog on Instagram at Nomad and Mode and online at nomadandmode.net, where I write all about fashion and travel. You can find all of the links to connect with me in the show notes. So with that, let's get into the episode. Hi, and welcome to the Fashion Ambition Podcast. Today, I'm so excited to be talking with Miriam Jangda, who is a fashion and accessories blogger. She's passionate about supporting local designers and businesses through her blog, Bobble Stories. Her blog has really taken off in the last year, so I'm really looking forward to hearing her perspective on growing a brand as a blogger. So today, we're going to be talking about some tips to help you grow your brand online, how to find your niche as a blogger, and how to balance blogging while working full-time. So welcome to the podcast, Miriam, and thanks again for being here. Hi, Natalie. Thank you so much for having me. So I really wanted to jump in um, with how you first started blogging and what kind of inspired you to kind of get started on that journey. So I guess a number of factors and they kind of worked hand in hand. You know, I had just moved to Toronto and was kind of figuring out what I wanted to do and you know, what was my path, et cetera. So uh, I took some courses and I had a degree in marketing and I knew that that was kind of the general field that I wanted to pursue. And I was really interested in accessories because I used to make uh, handmade accessories. I had this uh, small online business um, back in my hometown of Karachi. And so I always had that interest in fashion and color and style um, earlier on than before I st- uh, before I started this blog. And I kind of wanted to continue that, but not in so much of the creation aspect, but in some other way. So that's how I started the blog, made a website and just um, Uh, started talking about uh, different brands and different styles that I had and just a whole bunch of different like accessories with a jewelry focus. Mm -hmm. Um, And then sometime along that journey, I just found that, you know, I was kind of all over the place. I didn't have that niche. Um, I, you know, was talking about a number of things and I said, well, why, why are people really following me? You know, what am, what am I giving them? So I sort of uh, pivoted from that in the last uh, two years, I would say, to talk more about local businesses in the fashion and jewelry space still. Right. And then what was it about local businesses in particular that you wanted to, that you decided that you wanted to hone in on that? So I think local businesses really create a community and a city or a town or wherever that you live. They really define that place and they give, you know, the cultural aspect and they bring they bring together cultures. People bring in their crafts from their, um, you know, passed down from generations. Uh, it could be um, a style of clothing. Um, So in Karachi, you know, we have, we we wear something called a shawar kameez. It's our cultural dress. And I Mm -hmm. see like influences of that, um, you know, where it's a a tapered tunic type top, you know, that people would wear more of a dress over here. Or um, if you've seen uh, these shoes, they're called kuse. And I've seen a lot of brands bring that cultural aspect from India or Pakistan or, you know, another South Asian country here and they're bringing that cultural influence. So I think all those aspects build the community. And that's what I wanted to showcase through my blog is that, you know, there's all these different people doing different things and they add life and culture and color and everything to a city or a town. And I think that those people really need to be highlighted and yeah, brought to the forefront. Yeah, for sure. I think definitely what you said, like local businesses and designers really do kind of make a place unique. Um, And also one thing that I wanted to mention during this uh, podcast was because I think you do such 
a good job of spotlighting local businesses and, and designers. And so I wanted to mention the Canadian brand directory that you built on your website, bobblestories.com. Um, so I think you have, or I think you told me you have over a hundred businesses on there or well over a hundred businesses. So could you talk a little bit about that so that people can kind of um, visit it and learn more about the designers that you've showcased? Yeah, it's something that I had thought of doing for a while. And I guess I just didn't have the time because <laughs> it mm-hmm. takes a lot to create this directory that basically breaks down uh, different designers in terms of uh, clothing or beauty or accessories, um, even small local shops. So that's like the different categories that I have in this directory. And then even in the clothing, it's subcategorized into something if you're looking for more basic minimalist pieces or pieces like that you're just using basic pieces to build your wardrobe, but also if you're looking for athleisure wear, or if you're looking for more, if you have a style that's more colorful, more bold. So it it kind of caters to a, a number of people. So you can kind of drop down and pick whichever category of item that you're looking for. It just makes it really mm-hmm. easy for somebody to navigate. That's kind right. of what I wanted to make it, you know, uh, one place that somebody could go and find something if they were looking for it. Um, if you were looking for, let's say, um, some basic tank tops. So you could go to, you know, the clothing and the basics. And then, you know, I would give you a couple of options that you could look into and hopefully find something that was local, Mm -hmm. um, a local business or was, um, made locally, et cetera. So I've kind of categorized that as well to show you if something was made in Canada or just designed in Canada. So right. that's kind of how I've broken it down. And a lot of people have told me that it's been really helpful. So I'm mm-hmm. happy that, you know, all that effort is being put to good use. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's such a good resource. I've been on there a couple of times and found some like really cool brands through it. So yeah, definitely for those listening, definitely check it out. Um, and my next question was, I guess this is kind of um, segueing a little bit, but I was wondering for people who are just starting a fashion blog, what what um, tips would you give them to help them find their niche? Because you've done that really well now in in you know spotlighting local businesses. So, yeah, what would you say to somebody who's still kind of figuring things out? So I think it takes some time. There are people that you know just right off the bat know what they want to do. And mm-hmm. I can say that I wasn't that type of person. I had different thoughts and different ideas. I guess, try them out, you know, pick out things that you are really good at, that people come to you for, that you're the expert in. That's the kind of thing that you can talk about extensively and across different platforms because you are really passionate about that thing and you know it really well. And once you start putting out that content and people start to associate you with that, that's when they're really going to become followers and come back to you. Mm -hmm. So I... So just to like reiterate, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) just, um, so creating your niche, you just should find something that you are one passionate about and that you think that you're the expert in. Now Mm -hmm. you could go to your friends or people that you don't know and be like, or sorry, I would suggest that you go to your friends and ask them, you know, like what's, what's great about you and why do you, what do you bring to the table? And maybe there's some, a skill or something that you're really great at in terms of fashion. It could be that, you know, um, you are a petite person and you have really great skills in finding clothing that, you know, elevates your body shape, um, makes you seem taller. Maybe that's your, maybe that's your niche or maybe your niche is budget, um, uh, budget friendly clothing or, you know, for when Mm -hmm. you're in school or student style or stuff like that. So figuring out that niche is kind of just thinking through, jotting down, you know, what are you really good at? And what can you talk extensively about and build content around? And mm-hmm. it's not just a one-off. Yeah. Yeah. I really like your point about asking people like friends um, or family about what they know you for too. Um, I actually, in one of the other um, podcasts, I talked to um, a PR and communications expert and she actually recommended doing that in terms of asking people like what perception you're giving off and then is that in alignment with what you actually 
want people to know you for. I think having that outside perspective is really um, helpful because sometimes other people can see things that you don't necessarily see, or they can tell you like how you're coming across if it's, uh, if it's in a way that you don't necessarily want to be coming across. So I think, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen this where people, you know, post on Instagram stories, like a little quick poll, you know, two, three stories about, you know, what more would you like to see from me? Or how are you liking this content? Or do you like this content in this format? You know, Mm -hmm. getting that from your audience, whether that's from your audience, or if you don't have an audience at the time, you know, speaking to friends or speaking to people in the industry, yeah, really figuring out um, what it is that you want to be doing, um, and then honing into that. Yeah, definitely. So for you in this last year, you've you've really grown your platform quite a bit. Um, And so I was wondering, are there any tasks that you would say really helped your platform grow? Like in terms of were you posting a certain amount of stories or a, a certain amount of reels? Like what are some specific tasks that you could give people to to help them kind of grow in this next year? So I would say reels definitely it has made a like a big improvement in my audience, a big push in my audience, and I can see it for other people as well. And I hear um, uh, people who you know help out small businesses or influencers posting that you know you should definitely get on reels because mm-hmm. it's it's a new feature on Instagram and they're pushing people to like they're pushing that content more than. Uh, just regular static posts or carousel posts and stuff like that. Right. Um, so that has definitely helped. And it sort of came out um, like this, this feature came out last year and that's the time of the pandemic. And that's when I felt like, you know, um, I had a lot more time on my hands to develop this blog and really push it. And so that combined with the fact of reels and creating smaller videos, even IGTV videos, Mm -hmm. I did a a number of those. I did a number of Instagram lives during this pandemic. And I think all those factors of kind of getting myself out of my comfort zone, I think just for me personally, but also utilizing the different aspects of a social media platform really helped because mm-hmm. um, you were able to tap into different audiences, you know, oh. and in Instagram live, for mm-hmm. example, you were able to draw in that other person's audience as well. And, you know, if you had interesting things, they would follow you and, you know, so it yeah. kind of just um, snowballed from there. So yeah. I would say take advantage of the different aspects or new features uh, of an app. And I can say that even for TikTok, there's, just enormous growth and enormous potential there as well. And people are finding Mm -hmm. like immense success. Um, There's a jewelry designer based out of, based out of Calgary. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Um, Nadari. uh, So she's like a one woman show Mm -hmm. and she, I think started December of last year. She's over 60,000 followers now. As in like December, 2020. Yes. So just like three months. Yes. Wow. Okay. And the thing that I can say is be consistent. That's what I've seen from her. That's what I'm seeing from people that have grown immensely in a short amount of time Mm -hmm. is that set a pace for yourself. Don't, don't kind of burn yourself out and be like, Oh, I'm going to post like video a day, but then, you know, just burn out because after two weeks you're too tired. Yeah. (laughs) But incorporate different types of, um, different types of media into the the content that you're pushing out. So even if you have something, you know, you you make a blog post. So think about how you can um, translate that across different platforms. Can you like Mm -hmm. summarize that into a few points? Then you can make that into a reel. Can you create like in, can you go in on one of those points and um, really hone in on it and speak for maybe like two, three minutes and you can turn that into an IGTV, you know? Right. Um, and then you can keep like uh, maybe posting some quotes and stuff like that from your blog or any statements that you can kind of summarize maybe on Twitter. Twitter, mm-hmm. So you can get like the conversation going um, and kind of utilize different platforms um, yeah. just with one main post that you maybe uh, pushed out. 
Yeah. And that's a really good tip for in terms of like saving time too, because you don't necessarily have to make a brand new piece of content for every single platform that you're going to be publishing on. Sometimes it's about like repurposing that content. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good point too. And um, I guess kind of related to that is, you know, managing your time. A lot of the time people are, um, they're starting a blog or they're starting um, trying to become an influencer, but they have a full-time job or they're a full-time student. So I know that that was your situation for a while too. So I was wondering if you have any advice to kind of balance the two and still be able to grow your blog. Yeah, it's challenging. I'll say that. Um, mm-hmm. But if you're really committed and again, you're really passionate about what you are doing. And again, this goes back to the whole niche thing and, you know, finding what you're really passionate about. Mm-hmm. So you kind of, you know, have to schedule your day. And I think that's a really big part. And it seems very like, oh yeah, just schedule, you know, like what everybody yeah. says and <laughs> blah, 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 and planning, but you know, <laughs> it mm-hmm. actually does work. And even if you're planning, let's say two weeks in advance, that's kind of how I work. So I, I use a scheduling um, platform called Later for, for social posts, but then use ClickUp to kind of uh, work out my day. And it's kind of like a project management tool. Right. And so those two things have really helped me kind of figure out, you know, where my time is needed and how I can bet, best situate the day. So if I'm working... Um, you know, five days a week, nine to five sort of thing, then, you know, you obviously allocate that time, but schedule posts to go up during that time. So you're not silent um, between those eight hours of the day. Yeah. And that's where the scheduling app comes in. And then you use your evenings or your weekends. Like how can you break up the time? Now, when I find need to shoot some photos, I prefer to use natural light for those. So that is the weekend time best for me. So I can do those earlier in the morning Mm -hmm. and, you know, fit those into my day. And then maybe the writing aspect can be done in the evening because I don't require light for that. And, you know, um, even if it's not like not writing because I've been at my day job and maybe my brain is totally drained out. Um, but maybe I can just Mm -hmm. come up with some points, you know, to kind of get me going and get the ideas flowing when I do have the time to write, maybe that's on the weekend. So kind of just figuring out blocks of the day, And when you're best suited for something, and this will come over time, you'll figure out when, what time works for you and when you are more creative. Definitely. And I think once you do get kind of in the flow of your schedule, it makes you so much more productive and it just takes so much stress out because you're never wondering, okay, what is it that I have to focus on right now? So I think that that is, um, yeah, such an important point of, and just such an important part of being consistent in general. So yes, you don't want to be struggling the last second, you know, trying to figure out what to post. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then to your to your point about consistency too, it's really important because your audience is gonna forget you pretty quickly if you only put one post out every, you know, couple of months. You have to kind of keep that consistency so that you are top of mind and so that people do keep that like relationship with you and your content. So Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And the algorithm um, will help you with that. Too. Yeah. <laughs> if you're inconsistent, <laughs> then your posts will not be shown. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, there was this, I think it was like a TikTok account I was looking at and she had like, I think it was like 400,000 um, followers and she had only posted, uh, ten, I think I had counted like 10 times, which is like insane, just yeah. insane. The growth that some people are seeing on that p- platform. But another thing that I noticed was that she had like been consistent. There weren't large like gaps. It seemed yeah. between when she was posting. So yeah, just another point to consistency and how important that is. Um, so kind of jumping topics a little bit. I feel like you have done a really good job of building community around your brand because your whole brand is about supporting local small designers, small businesses. Um, So I was wondering, what are some tips that you would give somebody who is just getting started and they want to build their network? They want to build a community around their brand. uh, What would you say to them? So I would say that it's not all about building your community online, but it's also a lot of offline work. Mm -hmm. And I know that 
that's a little bit challenging right now. Yeah. Um, so I'll talk about that in a sec. But if you're online and you're trying to build your community, again, it comes back to being consistent. If you're on any social platform, try to reach out and to people that you think meet your target audience. So again, that's a little black work that you have to do and figure out, you know, who is your target audience? Who are you trying to attract with your with your, um, with your work? Right. So um, reach out to those people. And I think the best way is hashtags. So figure out a couple of the hashtags that work for your industry or whatever your content is about. Mm-hmm. And then go on those hashtags, see what kind of things people are posting and then start interacting with those posts and start getting a conversation going, whether that's on Twitter. So, you know, get into that and, you know, start commenting on people's uh, posts. So they'll start to recognize you and then, you know, kind of take your conversation, just more of a one-on-one, you know, start interacting with their posts. um, And then you're going to start developing that community and be like, yes, you know, we, that's how you create your Instagram friends or yeah, <laughs> whatever. There's a lot of people that I've met on Instagram that I haven't met in real life. And mm-hmm. it's just because, you know, we kind of had that shared interest um, online. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, just that's how I would say to sort of find those people, get into the conversation and, you know, um, put your brand out there um, right. within the right sphere. And you're going to start, you know, attracting the right people that you want to be putting your content in front of. Yeah. And in terms of when we can see people and meet in real life (laughs) and that magical time happens. your fingers. Yeah. (laughs) I would say go to events. Um, And the easiest way I think for me to search for that was initially when I moved here and I didn't know anybody went on Eventbrite. So that Mm -hmm. will kind of populate events that are in your area. And it can be a little intimidating. So I would suggest maybe bringing on a friend with you. Yeah. (laughs) And because sometimes these events are a hit or miss. So, you know, I'm going to say go with a grain of salt. You know, it's not always going to be the perfect event. But um, I did uh, find uh, I would I did go to an event. And from there, I found a group. Um, uh, that has a Facebook group online and it's just kind of blogger supporting bloggers mm-hmm. and, you know, they've, they've kind of helped me out whenever I'm in a little bit of a jam, even if it's like, you know, website support. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's a team of bloggers that have, you know, launched this collective and, um, it's kind of like, you know, your team and they understand what you're going through, even though their niches are completely different. Right. So that's kind of how something worked, you know, in my favor, I just didn't know what I was expecting from this event and, you know, went and it kind of worked out. Mm -hmm. So I would say that. And then for my particular um, niche, I'd say that uh, going to different local markets has been a big push in meeting people um, and getting my brand name out there and getting people to know what I do and how Mm -hmm. I can help them essentially too. Um, And that's been really great. Like I love going markets. That was something that, you know, kind of sparked this blog in, in a way as well yeah. um, was just seeing, you know, how different makers come together at these different events. And, you know, that sense of community was one of the factors that, you know, helped me deciding what I, what it is that I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's been, it's been good. So that's kind of the, some of the, the things that I would suggest. Um, yeah. Yeah. Get out of your comfort zone. You know, I know yeah. it's hard and yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I've definitely done that as well. Like find people, find groups rather online, definitely bring a buddy. It's kind of, it's nice to have somebody to go with and, and just kind of break that ice initially. Um, yeah. And then local markets too. Like I know the one of a kind show is a really great one in Toronto once they open back up again. Absolutely. Um, it's like my yeah. favorite. <laughs> yeah. Like seriously, I, I go there way too much and I promote it way too much, but yeah, it's really <laughs> that good. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so much fun. And there's so many different kinds of um, designers and biz- like just so many kinds of small businesses that you can discover. And it's just a lot of fun. And they do do some workshops too, which can be a good way to kind of sit down and, and chat with people and, and um, make connections that way too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But you did um, mention hashtags as a way to kind of find people online. And I think that's a really good point. Um, but I was wondering, do you have an example of the kind of hashtag you would search? Because I know sometimes people fall into the habit of, or or they make the mistake of finding a hashtag that's too broad. It's in their niche, but it's too broad. Like, for example, like 
fashion, for example. It's just, it's not, you know, specific enough. So for me, I go more like city-wise because I feel that my content, you know, talks more about local businesses. So I'll go like small mm-hmm. business Toronto or um, I'll go uh, s- support Toronto artists or Toronto creators or Toronto makers. So these are more specific to me. And that's the type of things that I would look into. Now, if your thing is not city-wise, mm-hmm. um, just hone in. If it's fashion, then maybe like petite fashion or plus size fashion. Um, or like uh, curvy girl, cur- curvy fashion. So kind of hone in on on that, you know, like go oh, one step further so that you're down into the hundred thousands or, you know, um, thousand posts per, per hashtag sort of category. Right. So yeah. you'll see a less frequency of posts this way. Um, and you'll see, you know, smaller people posting as well. And it's a little bit easier to connect with somebody who's a bit smaller because you'll know that, um, it's actually, you're speaking to that real person at the end of the day. (laughs) Yeah. Or if it's a brand, you know, there's, there's really maybe one or two people behind that brand and you're actually really talking to that brand. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's, um, I think an important, an important thing to note too, because, um, there are just so many hashtags out there. And if you're able to kind of find a smaller group, that's how you can find, or or like a more specific hashtag, that's how you can find a smaller group of people that are interested in, in something that, you know, relates to what you do. Um, So another thing that you kind of touched on earlier was the whole getting out of your comfort zone. And you mentioned this in like creating like different kinds of content, like reels, or even just going to the markets and putting yourself out there and and talking to people. Um, And I think that that, I mean, that's certainly something that I have, um, you know, had to work through as you create a blog and you put your face and your name and and what you think out there. Um, So what advice would you give somebody who's kind of struggling with that right now? And they're feeling unsure about putting themselves out there in that way. It's definitely hard, mm-hmm. <laughs> but take it like one step at a time. I know people who put out their face, maybe one every 20 posts, you know, it's kind of more of an introduction. Like you gained a bunch of followers. So you want them to know who you are and who your brand is. So, you know, you put in a face post and maybe it doesn't have to be like full on face, you know, right. it could be a little bit further back. Or it could be, you know, like a side shot or like, you know, you have something that slightly covers your face. Maybe it's a book or flowers or, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, any kind of prop really. Um, So take it like one step at a time. You know, it can be really hard to put yourself out there, but I do think that it is important and it definitely shows um, in your analytics that, you know, those posts definitely do much better um, than just... uh, other kinds of photos. Um, and so think at the end of the day that if you're posting on Instagram, um, it's a visual platform and people want to see like visuals, even when I'm working with some brands, you know, um, I will like suggest that, you know, oh, let's do a carousel post or something. One of those posts has to be a face. Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, it's just that people connect better to that. And, and I agree, but take it at your pace. It's, it's challenging but figure out how you can do something a little differently. So to give you an example and someone that you can check out is Matilda on video. Now, if you're really uncomfortable with um, showing your face or you just don't want to, you're not uncomfortable. You just don't want to for privacy reasons or any other reasons. Right. So I would say, check out Matilda on video. She talks about um, different beauty products and she has never shown her face. I have no idea who she looks like, but she (laughs) tries on um, a whole bunch of products, but it's on her hand, um, that she'll test out the products and she'll layer them on. And Mm -hmm. in no way does this not make me want to buy a product or not be influenced about a product. In fact, if anything, I'm intrigued to see what it would look like on me, you know? Yeah. So there's definitely ways to work around it. Um, but take it at your own pace. Don't feel pressure that everyone's doing it. So I need Mm -hmm. to do it. No. Yeah, (laughs) definitely. You have to kind of roll with what you're comfortable with on a like on a personal level because if you push yourself too fast 
you, it's going to hurt your consistency because you're not going to be like, it's almost like being emotionally ready for putting yourself out there. And also I think it's really, it's a lot easier to put yourself out there when you know what your niche is, you know, what your, the purpose behind your brand is and you know what it is you're talking about. Um, because once you, once you have that in place, you're not just putting out photos of yourself for the sake of it. There's actually a purpose behind every single post. So I think, yeah, that can really help in making you more comfortable and putting yourself and your brand out there too. Um, exactly. Yeah. So I think that we are coming to the end of our questions here. Um, there is one thing that I've been asking everybody in these interviews, um, and I think it can kind of get some really interesting questions, but um, what is one thing that you wish you had known when you first started either blogging or even at the very beginning of your career? What's something that you would have told your younger self? Okay. Younger self. Wow. That, that goes real far back. So I'm not, (laughs) (laughs) I don't know about that, but I would say being authentic. Now I know this is very, everyone's like, yeah, you know, it's like the catchphrase of the year or something, you know, like whatever, but it's so true. You, people will call you out if you're fake, like no tomorrow. Yeah. And it's maybe not so apparent when you have a smaller audience and I am guilty of that. So I will share something that's embarrassing, but true. (laughs) So when you, um, when you're, when you're a smaller influencer or blogger, you know, you get very excited when a brand reaches out to you and they're willing to gift you something. Mm -hmm. And cause you know, the, the experience is so new and so fresh and very exciting, you know, free stuff. Who doesn't want that? So (laughs) for a post, I mean, free stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you will kind of accept something, even if it doesn't fall into what your brand is about. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Or is so loosely based that you think, oh, you know, you're just pulling a stretch and like, no, it really does fit with my brand, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I've been guilty of that. Mm-hmm. Earlier on, I've, I've accepted gifts that, you know, didn't fall into that category of being local. Um, but, you know, I still like justified in the sense that it was still a small business that was still doing good in terms of maybe sustainably um, sourcing their products or creating sustainable um, products, but wasn't in Canada, let's say. Okay. So that was uh, somebody that I'd worked with and, but I still respect that person. I still push out their content um, because it's, it's someone creative and I still feel that they deserve to be shown. Um, Mm -hmm. But that was kind of something that I felt really bad about, you know, like just accepted something, but it wasn't really, about my brand and in the moment I was just like oh you know getting it for free (laughs) (laughs) so yeah just I would say come back to being being authentic and Mm -hmm. um you know don't showcase yourself as as a certain personality you know maybe um you're talking about budget fashion but you have like a whole bunch of designer items you know it just doesn't doesn't fit the bill. Now those things could be thrifted, let's say. So maybe that's mm-hmm. something you focus on. Um, you you could still be a designer lover, but not have the budget for it. Then hence right. you thrift, or maybe that's um, one of your values is how to obtain designer wear through uh, thrifting something. So just, um, I guess it comes back to your niche as well. And kind of remembering that every time you accept something, um, a collaboration of any kind or any kind of content that you put out there. Does this really align with who I am um, Mm -hmm. and what my values are? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that's such a good piece of advice because it, it strengthens, strengthens your brand. If everything that you're putting out there is something that lines up with that core like mission statement or the core values of your brand and your business. So I think that's a really good, um, piece of advice. So before we wrap up, um, I would love to know where can people connect with you and find you online? Yeah. At Bobble Stories. So that's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, yeah. It's, uh, so my website is bobblestories.com and then Instagram is just at Bobble Stories. Same thing with Twitter and Facebook and yeah. 
that's pretty much it. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Miriam, for taking the time to talk with me today. Uh, this was so fun. And as always, I feel like I always learn so much from you. So. Oh, thank you. I'm glad. <laughs> thank you for having me. This was fun. Thank you so much for tuning into the Fashion Ambition Podcast. If you liked this episode, make sure to leave a review. And if you got any great takeaways, I would love to hear your feedback. If you want to connect with me, you can find me on Instagram at Nomad and Mode and follow the podcast page at The Fashion Ambition to be updated whenever there's a new episode. I know that I always learn so much from each of the guests on the podcast, and I would love to know what stood out most to you. So feel free to tag me on Instagram with a screenshot of this episode and let me know what you learned. Thanks again and see you in the next episode of The Fashion Ambition.